Okay, we're getting close. April 8, 2024, total solar eclipse. Hard to believe. Almost seven years has passed since the last one, and now we're less than two months away. So we're getting we're getting down to crunch time here, and I thought I'd spend a little time just kind of reviewing this eclipse and then also going over some, hopefully, some useful information to help you plan and prepare and hopefully maneuver into a spot where you can see it. Now, I know a lot of you watching already have made specific plans. Maybe you've booked your hotels, your Airbnbs in the path. Maybe you live in the path, or maybe you have relatives that you know that live in the path, and you've already kind of made plans to be in a specific place. That's great. I wish you the best. I hope it all works out. But quite frankly, April is anything but reliable weather-wise. So the smart money says, be prepared to maneuver if you want to see this eclipse. And there's a lot of options as far as places to travel. And fortunately, we got some highways to maneuver on as well. But a lot of people are going to be converging to this spot also. So we'll get into that and we'll talk about weather as well as some uh, apps and tools that you can use to kind of help you plan, prepare and execute. And again, I realize a lot of you already have specific plans. But anyway, let's just go over this kind of as a review. So on April 8, 2024, we get another total solar eclipse. This is the second one in seven years, and it's pretty rare. The last one we had was August 21, 2017. I waited 33 years for that eclipse. The last total solar eclipse at the U.S. mainland prior to August 21, 2017 was in 1979, and it only clipped three or four states in the Pacific Northwest. So there was a 38-year gap from 79 to 2017, and now we get another one less than seven years later. So extremely rare. And we won't get another one after this one for another 20 years. So again, solar eclipses, normally you got to chase them. So it's pretty rare to have them come to you. Now I'm calling this eclipse the heartbreaker, and I'll explain why as we get into this. But again, a solar eclipse occurs when you have this rare syzygy alignment where the sun, moon, and the earth line up and... The moon comes between the earth and the sun, blocking out the sun's photosphere for a few brief moments, causing it to go dark on a specific spot on earth. Now, because the moon is so far away and it's much smaller, um, only a small section of the earth's surface, about 1% of the daylight side, actually gets to see the full umbral shadow where the totality occurs. So you got the deep shadow, the umbra, that's, of course, where you want to be if you want to see totality. And then you've got the penumbra. That's the part that if, you, if you're in the penumbral part of the shadow, you're only going to see a partial eclipse. Now, the moon is really far away compared to the Earth. And this diagram kind of illustrates it a little bit better. And also, the plane of the moon's orbit is tilted at a five-degree angle with respect to the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. So most of the time, the moon's shadow misses us. That's why we see a full moon and why we don't see a new moon. But every once in a while, we get a rare lineup where the moon blocks the sun. You can see here just how far away the moon is and how narrow the shadow cone is. Quite frankly, it's miraculous that we get eclipses at all when you think about the distances, the vast distances in our solar system. Now, again, the plane of the moon's orbit is tilted at a five degree angle with respect to the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. And most of the time, we don't get eclipses, but where those two planes intersect or nodes, when those nodes line up with a new moon and it's at perigee, then somewhere on Earth, we see a total solar eclipse. How often does that happen? On average, somewhere on Earth, roughly once about every 18 months or so. So three things need to occur in order for a total solar eclipse to happen. Number one, the moon has to be new. In other words, the moon has to be between the Earth and the sun in its new moon phase. Secondly, the moon has to be at or very near perigee. Perigee, of course, is the closest point in the moon's orbit around the Earth. The moon does not orbit the Earth in a perfect circle. It's slightly elliptical. So at its closest point, it's about 224,000 miles away. We call that perigee. At its furthest point, it's at about 252,000 miles away otherwise known as apogee. So if you want a total solar eclipse, you need a larger moon, and that moon needs to be at perigee, so slightly closer to us. The angular size of the moon varies about 
between apogee and perigee. So we need to be close to perigee. And then the third thing that needs to occur is that the, the, the moon needs to be located at one of its lunar nodes. In other words, the point where the planes of the Earth's orbit and the moon's orbit intersect. Those are called nodes. So when the moon is at a node, it's at perigee and it's new, then we have the conditions for a total solar eclipse. Now, we just had a solar eclipse a few months ago in October of 2013, or 2023. And at that point, the moon was further out, closer to apogee. It was actually four days removed from apogee. So it was a little bit further out in its orbit, and it didn't quite completely cover the disk of the sun. In that particular case, if you're in the path of annularity, you get what's called an annular eclipse. Annular meaning, it's the Latin term for annulus or ring. And so sometimes it's called a, a ring of fire. But basically, it means that the moon is further out. It can't completely cover the sun. So you get a, a ring of fire effect, if you will. We had that on October 14, 2023. I was fortunate enough to see this in Ely, Nevada, as part of a team from Exploratorium that did a live feed of this eclipse. And if you're interested in watching our experience and reliving that eclipse, we do have a video of that on our YouTube channel. So I'll just refer you to that, Memphis Astron Society. It was an interesting trip. And the team from Exploratorium will be doing another broadcast for the 2024 total solar eclipse. So this one was kind of a warm up for that event. So again, there's three types of eclipses. I've seen all three of these. There's a partial eclipse, which I saw in 1984, an annular eclipse, which I saw a few months ago in October of 2023, and then a total solar eclipse, which we had the opportunity, most of us, to see on August 21, 2017. And that's what we got coming up again in a couple months. Now, experientially, if you were to rank these on a scale of one to 10, a partial would be a three, an annular would be a seven, and a total eclipse would be a 10 million. Now, why is that? It's just, there's no comparison. If you're in the path of totality during a total solar eclipse, and it's clear when the moon completely blocks out the disk of the sun, all of these amazing effects occur that you just simply don't get with these other types of eclipses. So an annular is nice, ring of fire, partial is nice, but nothing compared to what you experience during a total solar eclipse. Again, if you're in that path of totality, and that's what we're gonna talk about where to go, how to get into that path. And again, really just try to encourage you since this is such a rare opportunity to make every effort to get into that path of totality. And here it is. Again, April 8th, you can see here that the, umbra, the, the moon's umbral shadow will sweep across parts of Mexico and the United States. And it's about 124 miles wide. It starts in the south part of Mexico, crosses into the southern part of uh, Texas, just clips San Antonio, Austin, uh, Waco, Dallas, all these communities are in, inside the path of totality. And then across Arkansas, parts of southern Missouri, Illinois, Carbondale, you're on the center line, you get another shot at it. Indianapolis, very close to the center line. And then Ohio, parts of New York across the Great Lakes, Lake Erie, Ontario, northern New York, Montreal, just on the edge of the path, parts of Maine, and then out to Newfoundland. April 8, 2024. This is the zone of totality that you want to be in. You want to experience totality. Now, why eclipses happen? Again, we talked about these three conditions. Moon's got to be at perigee. The moon's got to be located close to one of its nodes. And it's got to be in its new moon phase. How often does this happen? It turns out that the synodic period, in other words, new moon to new moon, occurs once every roughly 29 and a half days. We call that the synodic period from new moon to new moon. The anomalistic period, that's from perigee to perigee, when the moon reaches its closest point in its orbit, that happens every 27 and a half days. And then draconic to draconic, basically from node to node, if it's at one node and then it, 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 it uh, gets back around to that same node again, that happens every 27.2 days. Now, the ancient Babylonians discovered that if you do the math on this, over a period of 6,585 and a third days, you get an amazing lineup of basically these three events repeating themselves 
in the same roughly geographical location, not geographical location, but these, these three conditions repeating themselves and the eclipse geometry repeating itself every 6,585, roughly in a third days. What that translates into is 223 synodic months, 239 anom anomalistic months, or two, and, and it's the same as 242 draconic months. So when these conditions occur, you get the same eclipse geometry repeated, again, every roughly 18 years, 11 days, and and uh, eight hours, give or take. So the upshot of it is the eclipse that we're going to see in April is part of that family. It's called a Saros. So a Saros is, uh, is a family of eclipses where the eclipse geometry roughly re repeats itself every 18 years, 11 days, and eight hours. And the eclipse that we're going to see on April 8, 2024, is eclipse number 30 in that series. It's a family of eclipses that began in 1501, and it will end in the year 2763. So that is about a 13th century, 12 or 13th century span of eclipses. And you can see here where they're scattered throughout the globe. So 71 eclipses total. We're on eclipse number 30, so we're not even halfway through this family of Saros, if you will. And you got to wonder what the world was like, how dramatically different it was at the beginning of this Saros cycle, and how dramatically different it will be at the end. And we're not even halfway through. So it's a fascinating way to mark time, if you will, the, the passage of eclipses in a single Saros cycle. Sky and Telescope did an interesting article on this in their January 2024 issue. I would encourage you to check it out if you subscribe. And here you can see what we're talking about, that the April 8, 2024 eclipse, the geometry of it is very similar to the eclipse that occurred 18 years ago on March 29, 2006. And that eclipse occurred in North Africa, again, because the Saros repeats every 18 years, 11 days and eight hours. And in eight hours, the Earth's the Earth uh, rotates a third of the way through. In other words, 120 degrees along its rotational axis. So that's why you get the geometry repeating itself in another part of the globe. So the March 29, 2006 eclipse was the previous eclipse, number 29, in this Cero cycle. And the one that we've got coming up in April will be number 30. And if you want to see it again, that same eclipse will be repeated in, on April 20, 2042. Now, again, you'll have to travel to another part of the world because in the Saros, eight hours, it will, it'll, the, the, the Earth will rotate another third of the way around. So it'll be somewhere probably in the Pacific or in Asia. I've got to look exactly where that is. But what's interesting is every three Saros cycles the eclipse geometry repeats in roughly the same geographical location. This is called an exilogimos. And we can see this for the one we saw a few years ago on August 21, 2017. The one that crossed the country was very similar to the one that occurred on July 20, 1963, 50 years or 54 years earlier, a little bit further north along the globe. But um, the one that we're going to see in April will again occur very close to where it is in April, 54 years from now, specifically on May 11, 2078. And you can see the eclipse path here for that particular eclipse. On May 11, 2078, it will cross parts of Mexico, actually miss Texas. It'll be visible in New Orleans, part of Southern Mississippi, Alabama. It looks like Atlanta, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. Now. You're watching this, you'll probably miss it. But if you have children or grandchildren who are young, they'll be senior citizens when this particular eclipse occurs. Wouldn't it be interesting to get them into the path of the April 8, 2024 eclipse and let them know that when they become grandparents themselves, they may have a chance essentially to see the uh, same eclipse again, just a little bit further south. So anyway, just a little bit of uh, eclipse Eclipse signs there. 
The other thing about this particular eclipse is that it, it occurs very close to true perigee. Now, perigee is kind of roughly defined as within 10% of the closest point to the orbit of the uh, of the moon's uh, orbit to the earth. So if you're within 10% of true perigee, we kind of just call that in general perigee, give or take, it's, it's, it's roughly defined. But anyway, the upshot of it is the April 8, 2024 eclipse occurs the night or occurs the day after true perigee. So the moon reaches true perigee the night before the April 8, 2024 eclipse. What does that mean? Um, since we're so close to perigee, we get a slightly larger disk than what we had for the 2017 eclipse and a little bit longer duration. The closer you are to perigee, the larger the moon is in terms of its angular size in the sky, and typically the longer eclipse you're going to have. In fact, in this particular Saros 139, if you wanted to see the longest duration eclipse, that occurs in the year 2186. And people who see that eclipse will actually get seven minutes and 29 seconds of totality. So, of course, none of us will be around to see it. But you can see here that as we progress through this Saros cycle, that we're getting closer to <clears throat> um, true, true perigee. And that, that, again, occurs when in 2186, when the uh, angular separation is about zero degrees from true perigee. So... But this is a good eclipse too, the one we're getting on April 8, 2024. Now, there are multiple serial cycles. So fortunately, you don't have to wait 18 years between eclipses. The one we saw on August 21, 2017 was part of Saros 145. Part of the reason why it was so successful for us, I think, is because we didn't have a specific event planned. We gave people the flexibility to maneuver throughout the path and we were scattered throughout the uh, path of totality. And many of us, most of us, in fact, saw the eclipse. So it's wonderful to have such a high success rate and know that coming into this one, many of us are no longer eclipse virgins. We've seen one, at least one. And here you can see some of the pictures that are members of SNAP during totality. Again, this is when the moon blocks the photosphere of the sun and you can see the, the brilliant corona, the outer atmosphere. This is a picture by one of our members in Kentucky. Here's one that Freddie took in Perryville. Ross took this one in Cape Girardeau. They're actually in the path of totality for the uh, 2024 eclipse also. Got to hope for clear skies. And then uh, Bob Knight took this one in Kentucky. You can see some prominences on the edge. And this one was taken at a Waffle House. Uh, the one on the right, just snagged that from... Uh, from Facebook actually. And then one of our members took the one on the left in Dover, Tennessee. So it was a magnificent experience. And of course this one was uh, featured in Sky and Telescope uh, for the April, 2023 edition. This is by Fred Espinac. You can see a composite here of the front and back end of the eclipse with totality in the middle. So really spectacular. I was in Lebanon for the 2017 eclipse. We had two minutes and 32 seconds of duration. Cloudy skies early, but they cleared as we got into the deep partial phases. And we just had a magnificent view of totality under clear skies. So it worked out. During the partial phases, not much is happening. Right after first contact, when the moon takes that first bite out of the sun, you're basically just watching the, the moon slowly move across the disk. I think this is exciting because it is kind of cool to see the moon and the sun line up and to see the moon just slowly take larger chunks out of the sun. You will need, of course, uh, special eye glasses, the uh, the eclipse glasses or the, the Lunt sun oculars or solar filters on your telescope. Never look at the sun during the partial phases without the proper protection. But if you're fortunate enough to look through a solar filter telescope, you may notice sunspots on the disk of the sun. And we got a pretty active solar disk right now. So we should see some pretty good um, solar activity during the partial phases. When you get into the deep partial phases, things get really interesting. Now these images were taken in Memphis by one of our members who didn't travel to the path, but it's an example of what happens when you get about 95 or 96% eclipsed. And 
You get a crescent sun. The shadows begin to change. They get sharper and more pronounced. The light dims. And it's kind of like an HD lens over everything. It's a really eerie kind of light. Very foreign. Very alien. And you only get to see that during the deep partial phases of a, of a total solar eclipse. So pay attention to what's going on around your, in, in your surroundings as you get closer to totality. It's really a magnificent experience. The other thing is if you're <clears throat> in an area where there are trees and you see leaves, uh, the, the, the light filtered through the, the leaves uh, the, really creates these eerie crescent-like shadows you know, because the sun, of course, is mostly eclipsed. So you don't see a disc anymore. You see just little crescents. And you can actually duplicate this with your fingers. You can make a grid with your fingers and you can see little crescents as you filter the, the light through your fingers on the ground. So you don't need um, an instrument necessarily. Now, another thing you can use is a colander. These are some images taken in Ely, Nevada for the annular eclipse. Some of the members there had uh, a colander, of course, is what you use to strain water for pasta, spaghetti, whatever. Most of us have this in our kitchen. That's a good tool to use. And you can see some of the crescents that were projected on the wall during the deep partial phases of that eclipse. And uh, the, the, the website, uh, eclipse.aas.org, shows you instructions for how to do pinhole projection. Pretty simple, but feel free to check that out. As we get toward the end, about 99%, those last few seconds before totality, the diamond ring forms. Most of the moon is covered by the sun, and you get those last rays of brilliant sunlight through the edge of the moon, followed by Bailey's beads. Again, the, the, the limb of the moon is not completely smooth. There's mountains and valleys, and the, the last little wisps of sunlight are filtered through the edge of the moon, the, uh, the, the mountains and valleys on the edge of the moon. And this picture was taken by Fred Espinac during a 1999 solar eclipse. Uh, 1991. So this is um, right before totality. And then seconds later, of course, the, the moon covers the sun and it goes from day to night instantly. And the sky changes, brilliant stars, uh, bright stars and planets come out. And then of course the corona just bursts forth. And if you're able to time this just right, a second or two before totality, I, again, this is off the record, but if you're able to look at it just before, you can catch the transition from uh, Bailey's beads to totality, and then the corona comes out, and it's just a magnificent sight. So summed up here by this quote from Mabel Lomas Todd for a solar eclipse in 1896. Then an instantaneous darkness leapt upon the world. Unearthly night enveloped all. With an indescribable outflashing at the same instant, the corona burst forth in mysterious radiance. But dimly seen through thin cloud, it was nevertheless beyond, beautiful beyond description. A celestial flame from some unimaginable heaven. Simultaneously, the whole northwestern sky, nearly to the zenith, was flooded with lurid and startlingly brilliant orange, across which drifted clouds slightly darker, like flecks of liquid flame or huge ejected from some vast volcanic Hades. The west and southwest gleamed in shining lemon yellow. Least like a sunset, it was too somber and terrible. The pale broken circle of coronal light still glowed on with thrilling peacefulness, while nature held her breath for another stage in this majestic spectacle. Mabel Lomas Todd, August 9, 1896. And of course, you see some other pictures that some people took during the last solar eclipse, heavily covered. Now let's talk for a moment about what you're gonna see during totality. And to do this, I'm actually going to bring up another program here, and you can do this yourself. Um, just go to Google and type in Stellarium. This is a free program. You don't need to download an app or anything. They have a web version here. If you bring it up, you can see here it simulates conditions in the sky. So now I'm going to plug in a location that I know is in the path of totality. Just go here to the left. And let's just go to Hardy, Arkansas. This is one of the spots that we're we're targeting as a possible site to see the eclipse. 
very near the center line. So we'll do that. Actually, I'm going to do it again here. And I'm going to tell it to use this location. So now I'm in Hardy, Arkansas. Here it comes. Use this location. So on the lower left, it shows me Hardy. Lower right, I'm going to change my date. And I'm going to go to April 8th. And of course, I got to go back in time. So the eclipse starts about 1230. And let me go ahead and see if I can find the sun. So there it is. You can see here if I zoom in that uh, the sun and the moon are about to line up. Now I can move forward in time. I know that the partial eclipse starts a little after 1230. So I can simulate this. Of course, you can check your eclipse timer and all that. But first contact, again, started around 1244. I can zoom in. Now, that's not exact. But basically, quarter to one, give or take, is when first contact begins. And now I can progress through the uh, partial phases. It takes about an hour. And I just got to get to the punchline here pretty quickly. So I know that the uh, totality is going to occur around 153 in this location. But you can see here as the moon is moving across the disk of the sun, even though I'm simulating this, it's uh, the program is changing the sky a little bit. So now I'm at 149. And if I zoom in on the sun here, you can see that the moon has covered most of the sun. All I can see is a sliver here. And that gets into, again, 96 97% eclipsed sun and this is where all your strange effects start to occur dim light crescents for shadows edges of our of, of your shadows more pronounced uh you see a you know you can experience a cooling effect if there are insects and birds around or animals they may start to behave in a very different way kind of bedding down for their nocturnal state and then, of course, totality occurs around 152, 153. So now at 154, we have reached totality in Hardy, Arkansas. Now, what do you see in the sky? It's going to be a deep twilight on the horizon. So it's not dark like night. But you will have a shot at three or four brighter planets. So Venus will be out. Look for it in the lower right. And if we zoom in on the planet Venus here, you can see that it's very nearly a full Venus on April 8, 2024. So it should be pretty bright in the sky and pretty easy to see. Saturn also, it's a little lower. You got to look for it. It's a little bit further away, but you should be able to see, should be able to see Saturn. Now, Mars, I don't know. It's reaching... Uh, its maximum point from Earth, so it's going to be pretty faint. So I wouldn't get my hopes up about Mars. And Jupiter also you should be able to see. Now, if we were able to zoom in on Jupiter with a telescope, which we won't because we won't have time, but you would see the four Galilean moons also, Europa, Callisto, Ganymede, and Io. And that's the configuration during totality on April 8th. And in fact, if you could zoom in to the disk of Jupiter, with a powerful enough telescope, you might actually be able to see the great red spot. So I don't know, maybe we'll take a Dobsonian into the path on uh, April 8th. Just kidding. We won't have time. Other planets that are out, Mercury, probably not going to see it. Too faint. And uh, Neptune and Uranus are also out. So you won't have a lot of time, but we got about four minutes to work with if you're near the center line. So definitely pay attention to your surroundings, especially during totality. 360 degree sunset on the horizon. You can see where the moon is positioned about two o'clock in the afternoon. So, we'll, you know, it's not exactly straight up, but still high enough up. Uh, Jupiter, yes. Venus, yes. Saturn, probably. And uh, let's go ahead and put on our constellation map here as well. So where is it located? You can see here that uh, the sun is still in the constellation Pisces. So again, 
the zodiac are the family of constell constellations where the sun sweeps through at a certain time of the year. So in March and April, the sun is between um, us and the constellation Pisces. So when the moon blocks out the sun, you see the zodiac constellation for that particular month. We saw Leo in 2017 for that eclipse. And here, you know, the, the, the sun will be in Pisces. Now, none of these stars will be visible because they're too faint. But you might have a shot at uh, some of the brighter stars in Orion. They're going to be a little closer to the horizon. But um, Betelgeuse and Rigel might be visible. And also the Pleiades and Taurus. Now, I wouldn't get my hopes up. It's still going to be pretty faint. But um, you never know. So keep your eye out for what's in the sky. If you see the Pleiades cluster, you see bright Jupiter and, probably, and definitely bright Venus and maybe one or two other of the bright stars. It's, uh, it's a pretty, pretty spectacular sight during totality. So again, we got four minutes. If you're near the center line, should be plenty of time to stare at the corona. Uh, check out the bright stars and planets that are around. Survey the landscape, get the 360-degree sunset, and then just kind of take it all in. It's a magnificent experience. So we covered that. Uh, the other thing is with four minutes to work with, if you're near the center line, you might have the opportunity to sketch the corona. Now, some of you are going to be photographing it. I'm not one of them. Um, but if you don't photograph it, you could, in theory, take some time to take a pencil and actually sketch what you see. The coronal streamers, maybe some of the prominences on the edge of the disc. You can see here an example that uh, Debbie Moran did for one of the eclipses that she observed early on. I think it was the one 40 years ago. She's traveled all around the world and, and seen solar eclipses in multiple locations around the world going back 40 years. So this is a sketch of, I think, her first eclipse in Indonesia back in the early 80s. Um, so it would definitely make the experience more memorable. Again, here's the path of totality. And we'll talk more in detail about where to go and how to maneuver in the path to best see this. Very important, during the partial phases, you've got to have the special eye protection. Solar filtered glasses, make sure they're ISO certified. If you're part of the Memphis Astronomical Society community, we'll be handing them out for free at our meetings as well as the event itself. During totality though, if you're in the path, again, if you're in the path of totality, this narrow band here, when the moon blocks the disk of the sun, it is safe to take off your eclipse glasses and look directly at the sun. In fact, I recommend it. Yeah, you'll never forget it. I mean, you can take pictures, but there's no picture that even the best astrophotographers in the world can take that can come close to what your eye sees. Uh, it's, it's an unforgettable experience. So I would say during totality, spend at least 60 to 70 percent of your time just staring at the eclipse sun and just pay attention to what's, you know, what's happening. The corona is not a static thing. It's very dynamic. It literally looks like a kind of a liquid fire in the sky. I mean, you're seeing these magnetic field lines and this plasma from the sun streaming out. It's just an amazing experience. The other thing is regular handheld binoculars. I had them on site, was able to look through them unfiltered at the eclipse sun and see more details, including any bright stars or planets that are nearby. nearby. So so your time during totality is, is important and it'll go pretty quick. And of course, when the eclipse is over, you put your eclipse glasses back on. Now, if you want the solar eclipse glasses, we're getting down to it here, but eclipseglasses.com is your site. You can still order them. We just got a batch. We have these available also to anyone for free for if, you, if you're on site or you know, if you come to one of our meetings between now and, and this event. Here they are by the Memphis Astronomical Society. The other thing is they make a, a solar snap app. I was actually able to use this for the Ely eclipse and it basically just snaps on the back of your iPhone. You can take some pictures of the partial phases. 
You can see here on the right some of the pictures I took of the annular eclipse in Ely on October 14. These are nowhere near DSLR quality for your astrophotographers, but if you're an amateur and you just want to take some pictures to kind of share with people on social media in, in, in real time for your experience, this might be worth checking out. You can get this again at eclipseclasses.com. I like the sun oculars. I just ordered a couple more pair. You can get these on American, greatamericaneclipse.com or just go to Amazon. And these are Lunt solar filtered binoculars. These are a great choice also. Talk more about the path and how you can plan for where you're gonna go. I'll save that for another video. A couple of apps here as we're wrapping up. Um, I like this app, it's very simple to use. It's called Totality by Big Kid Science. And this will really help you kind of laser, uh, narrow down and get specifics on any location. And um, just a lot of details. I've got a separate video on this that I'll share that goes into basically how to use this, but it's very simple. It is free and you can figure it out pretty quickly. So check that out. They also have an Eclipse Timer app, like a small charge, a buck and a half or whatever it is. And this, very easy to set up and it will actually speak to you and tell you when first contact is starting, when totality is starting, when to look for shadow bands, when to put your glasses on, when to take them off. Um, you, can, you can map this out and the, the app will literally remind you of each of the stages of the eclipse. So this is also a really good app. You wanna know when the next one is? August 23, 2044. And you can see here that it just clips Northern Montana and Northwestern Oklahoma. And we only get a minute and 41 seconds of duration for those of you who are planning ahead 20 and a half years into the future. So that is it. Um, again, April 8, 2024, we're less than two months away. It's fascinating how we mark time. So we saw this 2017 eclipse, it seems like not that long ago. Some of you traveled to Chile to see the one in 2019. Most of you didn't for 2020 because of COVID. And here we are again, April 8, arguably a better eclipse because of longer duration and a more active corona. And many of you have specific plans already. I would say keep your options open and be flexible because the weather is certainly gonna be potentially a factor for this one. And you don't wanna tie yourself down necessarily to one spot without the flexibility and the possibility of moving. But if you're under clear skies, in the path of totality, it will certainly be an unforgettable experience. Monday, April 8, 2024, we're less than eight weeks away.